For he alone is worthy. Amen? Amen. Well, I hope uh, that your yesterday's Christmas celebration was everything that you hoped it would be, dreamed that it could be. And as uh, O'Neill said earlier, I trust that that same attitude will continue on even though the 25th of December has passed. We still celebrate God with us, Emmanuel. Amen? Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Isaiah, or Isaiah if you prefer, chapter 9. We're going to yet again be looking at a very, very familiar passage of Scripture read this time of the year. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Just one verse this morning. But unlike uh, O'Neill's comfort to you the other night, (laughs) might be just a little longer this morning, even though we're only looking at one verse. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 says this, "For For to us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now, I am no prophet. I've been given no word of knowledge this morning, but uh, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that sometime in the past 24 to 48 hours, Everybody in this room probably has had an opportunity to give or receive a gift. And if you didn't see me before you leave, I want you to experience that before you leave here uh, today. And maybe you're like me, and and you can recall in times past either receiving a gift on Christmas morning or giving a gift on Christmas morning. And by the time Christmas night arrived around, that gift was gone, destroyed, destroyed. Banjacks just absolutely as though it never existed. I can recall a time when Barbara and I were first married and we gave my baby brother, who was still living at home at the time, a gift. And then later on, as siblings do, we got into a little bit of an altercation on Christmas afternoon. And Christmas night I went in and there was that gift that we had labored over. This would be the perfect gift for him, completely destroyed. We laugh about that today. We weren't laughing about it then. <laughs> But maybe you can recall a time when you gave a gift or you received a gift that lasted many, many days, many, many months, many, many years. Maybe you still have some of those gifts today that no matter how many times you look at it, use it, uh, pick it up, remember it, it brings you the same amount of joy as it did the moment you first received it. Advertisers through the years have tried to pick up on this, the essence of this, this feeling here. Companies like Kodak and companies like Hot Point Appliances have, have come up with a slogan or have used a slogan. No one's quite sure who actually came up with it to capture that essence. And, and, and the slogan goes this, Kodak cameras, the gift that keeps on giving. This morning from Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 I trust that we're going to see that Christ, the Messiah, the one Isaiah is prophesying about here, has come more for more than just our eternal salvation. He is the Savior. He is Jesus Christ, the Savior. That's magnificent. And and, and this is not me in any way trying to, to minimize that. It's super important. But what I hope we'll see in this one passage of Scripture is that Christ also supplies an unending array of blessings and benefits to his followers. So this morning, I want to talk about this baby, this Christ child that was in the manger in Bethlehem, truly is the gift that keeps on giving. Let me give you just a little bit of Small bit of context here to where we are in in chapter 9, verse 6 of Isaiah. As you know, Isaiah is prophesying that there's a time of peace and a time of restoration coming for Israel. Though they have been in captivity to the Assyrians and to the Babylons, and after years and years of bondage at the hands of their enemies, 
We see in chapter 9, verse 2, if you just glance up the page just a moment, that light is coming into the world and going to dispel the darkness that Israel has experienced these past number of decades. Verse 4, Isaiah describes it this way, that the yoke of bondage is going to be broken. Verse, and continuing on in verse 5, you see the artifacts and the instruments of warfare are going to be burned. Why? Because they're going to be no longer needed because there's a time of peace that's coming to Israel, even though the past number of decades have meant bondage in captivity. How will this happen? What's going to be the catalyst for such a turn of events for Israel? Well, the question is really not what's going to happen, but Who's going to happen? Who is it that's going to bring about such a drastic change in the fortunes of God's people? And so here we have 700 years, give or take, before the birth of Jesus Christ, Isaiah prophesies the birth of a child. Did you see what he said there? To us, a child is born. Redemption is coming for Israel in the form of a newborn baby. A son is given. Given. Not purchased. Not deserved. But he is a gift given to first the Jew, then the Gentile, to the whole world. Remember, good news for great joy for all people. Isaiah goes on and continues, and the government will be upon his shoulders. This child will grow to bear the burden of governing God's people. Isaiah, he is making a statement of this child's rule and authority. The safety, the security, and the prosperity of God's people are going to rest squarely on the shoulders of this child and on his shoulders alone. Well, what person, let alone what baby, could shoulder such responsibility? Who is this child? What is his name? Isaiah's going to now tell us, and this is where I really want to camp out for the duration of this message. And we need to understand that in these times and in this part of the world, names were a very significant consideration given to a baby. In some parts of our world, it's, it's more significant today than others. But naming a child is very, very difficult. What is the name to capture that? But, but in these days, it was especially important because the name was more than just what was going to be on the birth cert for official uh, government records. A person's name was a description of one's stature and one's Character, And so a name was as much descriptive as it was merely an identifier. Oh, oh I know him. But, but in, in knowing his name, I know something about that person. When I think of this, my mind went to, if you've ever watched a boxing match or a movie about a boxing match, and you see just before the big bout, there's, there's, everybody's in the ring, and the ring announcer, he grabs the microphone, and he starts introducing the combatants. But he doesn't say, this is just... Uh, Mike versus Joe. Now, what does he say? He says, in this corner, marvelous Marvin Hagler. James, bone crusher Smith. I don't want to be in the ring with anybody named bone crusher. Hector, macho, Camacho. I can identify with him. I'm kidding. Or, or this one, Iron Mike Tyson. Is his name Iron? Is his name Macho? Is his name bone crusher? No, but hearing that, we, they're trying to convey something about the nature and the character of this competitor. So this child, we know, is going to be given the name we know most commonly as Jesus, right? That's, that's the name that, ain't, that Gabriel told Mary in Luke 131. You'll call him Jesus because he will be the savior of his people. But here Isaiah attributes the Christ child with other proper names that indicate his nature, his attributes, his work, and his deity. Now we need to remember just a couple of chapters previously, Isaiah has already introduced us to this child once. Said he will be called Emmanuel, God with us. 
Here in 9.6, we're given four other names of Jesus that describe the blessings and benefits that the gift of Christmas continuously provides to his followers. Jesus Christ truly is the gift who keeps on giving. Let's consider first, and all of this is in, in verse 6 there, the gift of wisdom, the gift of wisdom. Isaiah says his name is Wonderful Counselor, Wonderful Counselor. Now, there are many contrasts. If you read the Bible from start to finish, you're going to see a constant, almost themes throughout the Bible where there are things, uh, one uh, situation contrasted with another. You have light contrasted with darkness. You have sin contrasted with righteousness. You have those who are faithful contrasted with those who are faithless. One of the most common themes that we see through the scriptures is the wise contrasted with the foolish. Who is the wise? Well, there's many ways to answer that question, but one such indication uh, of wisdom is found, you guessed it, in the book of Proverbs. It is the book of wisdom. Listen to Proverbs eleven fourteen. Where there is no guidance, a people falls. But in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. What is a counselor? Again, many ways to define that word, but, but, but we know a counselor most commonly as, as one who gives counsel or who gives advice or who gives uh, instruction or who gives wise opinions. This baby is going to be known as counselor, but not just counselor, wonderful counselor. Now, this word wonderful here, I didn't realize this until I started digging into this passage a little bit. It's an interesting word. Because it sounds to us in English like an adjective, doesn't it? Describing the counselor. He's a wonderful counselor. And he is. But this word wonderful in the original language is actually a noun. Some have even said this is a separate, distinct name for Christ. He's wonderful. Counselor. But this word wonderful really is one, we could just look at it this way. It's a word that alludes to the child's deity. He is wonderful. He is superior in his wisdom. He is the supreme counselor. He's wonderful counselor. We see this reiterated in our New Testament. Speaking of Christ, the apostle Paul says in Colossians chapter 2 in verse 3, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In him are hidden some? A bit? Most? All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. To me, that describes wonderful counselor, does it not? Christ provides wisdom on, I just started rattling off a few and, and cut it off just because I didn't want to be too long today. Relationships, finances, anxiety, employment, work, church, family, parenting, marriage. We can go to Christ Jesus and get his counsel on all of these areas of our life. Anybody ever need counsel in those areas? For so many are quick, but so many are quickly to turn to psychiatry, psychologists, sociologists, secular counselors, colleagues, solicitors, or we consult no one and just follow our own gut or worse yet, follow our heart. Now, that latter situation is completely understandable for those who do not know Christ. They, they really have no other viable options except to glean from what little wisdom these secular institutions actually might have stumbled across. But far too often, the church are so quick to turn to the world for counsel and, 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 and to go to the world for advice. I've got this situation, but I, I, I listened to this guy speaking the other day on the radio before ever consulting with the wonderful counselor. Do you find yourself in need of wisdom this morning? Do you need counsel in an area of your life this morning, or if you're like me, in lots of areas of your life this morning? Let me just encourage you before turning to the world, before turning to man's opinion, before reading the latest best-selling self-help book, before watching or listening to a TED talk on YouTube, 
May I encourage you to first always and continually consult the wonderful counselor. Here's one of the greatest promises in your Bible, James chapter 1 and verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who generously gives generously to all without reproach. Here's the promise. And it will be, here's our word for the day, given him. God's wisdom is always available to God's people. Ask and it will be given to you. My, my prayer for us this morning would be to echo Paul's prayer for the Ephesian Christians. That it would always be on the forefront of our minds. Paul told them in chapter 1, verse 16, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. What was his prayer? That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may, here it is, give you the spirit of wisdom and of the revelation of of the not revelation in the knowledge of him. Jesus Christ gives wisdom. He is the wonderful counselor, but he also gives us security. He gives us security. What was the name Isaiah gave to him there? Mighty God. This word mighty God, El Gabor, it, it speaks of God's protection of his people, specifically this Christ child's protection of his people. The word carries with it a connotation of military leadership and authority. That's probably why the Jews didn't recognize Jesus because they were expecting what? A military Messiah. We need to know because Isaiah has called Jesus here mighty God that Jesus' authority is not limited and is not inhibited. Inhibited. Jesus' authority is not inhibited. What does this mean? All that he desires to do will happen. You ever feel like this could be, this, this could be the end? Not, not, not if we're reading our scriptures and we understand our mighty God together. All that he desires to do will happen. And here's the great thing for us, just tying back into that previous point. All that he promises will come to pass. All that he promises will come to pass. What did Jesus say before he ascended to heaven? Matthew 28, 18. Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Has been given to him. He's not going to assume this authority someday. He, he has this authority. It's been given to him by the Father. What does this mean for you and I? Hmm. How much time do we have? What does this mean? It means this. Once we're adopted into the family of God, God will never disown you. He's promised to keep you. Nor will he allow anyone or anything or any circumstance or any situation to dislodge you from his hands. Means, among other things, that the salvation this Christ child purchased for us is secure. No one can take it from me. You cannot lose it. And, and trust me, if you could, you would. If I could, I would. Jesus said in John 10, 27 and 28, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Listen to his language. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Why can no one snatch them out of his hand? Because he's mighty God. He has promised to preserve those who are in Christ. This is why Isaiah would say in chapter 54, speaking of the servant, uh, suffering servant, no weapon that is fashioned against you shall succeed. I like the King James translation of that one. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And you shall refute every tongue that rises against you in judgment. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their vindication is from me, declares the Lord. He is mighty God. That gives us great security. Thirdly, he gives us the gift of constant care. The gift of constant care. Why? Because he's everlasting father. 
If you're reading your Bibles carefully here and you're realizing that Isaiah is speaking about Jesus Christ, the Christ child, the second person in the Trinitarian Godhead, and then you see Isaiah calling him here everlasting father, if you're very careful there, listen, reading carefully, you might be a little bit confused because you say, wait a minute, Jesus is the everlasting father? Then who's the everlasting father? <laughs> well, don't be confused. Let hopefully clear this up for you this morning. Why does Isaiah refer to this Christ child as everlasting father? I'll give you two reasons. Number one, in the Old Testament, fatherhood spoke as much of headship as it did parent, parenthood. Do you remember what God told uh, Abraham in Genesis 17, 4? Behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. In other words, Abraham occupies a place of headship for all of those who ultimately come to God through Jesus Christ. We know from Ephesians again, Ephesians 5, 23, Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. So we see fatherhood connected to headship there. The second reason we need not be concerned about this language of fatherhood is the care that Christ provides. We have mighty God as our <laughs> Savior. That, that could be a frightening thought, right? I mean, just if, if, if someone all-powerful is over me, that, that could be very scary if that power was, mis, was misused. But we see here, he's everlasting, not ruler, not dictator. He's everlasting father. It speaks of his care. He's not a harsh father, but a loving, caring one. See, some people may not be moved by the notion of Christ's fatherhood. Some, some may not have had great examples and relationships with earthly fathers. Some, some may have never known their earthly father. Some may have been in an experienced abandonment by their earthly father. But can I just give you some encouragement this morning? This is nothing you need fear with your everlasting father. He, he cares for you. He, he, he's not going anywhere. It, it, this speaks of uh, his eternality, right? It, remember what Gabriel said to Mary? Again, going back to Luke chapter 1, verses 32 and 33. He, speaking of Jesus, the baby, will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. His everlasting fatherhood speaks of its headship. It speaks of his care. But we could also say briefly, it speaks of his faithfulness to us. It speaks of his faithfulness to us. I have said this to my kids, and, and, and maybe your parents said it to you, or maybe you said it to your own kids. You never need worry. I will always be there for you. Now, that's, that, that's a very true statement in sentiment. But, but in reality, that's not altogether true, is it? I mean, if, if, if the providence and, of, of God and how the, how the halls of time tend to go, there, there's going to be a day someday where I'm not going to have my earthly father here with me any longer. And, and, and my kids will not have their earthly father with them any longer. So I'm not... Lying when I say I'll always be here for you, but, but I realize that, that, that my always being here for someone is limited by our appointment with death that awaits us here. But Christ has no limitation. Christ can and Christ will make the promise. And Christ does make the promise that I will always be here for you. He is eternal and everlasting. He's not going anywhere. How can Paul have such confidence in eight, Romans 8, 38 and 39, where he says this, I am sure that neither death nor life, angels nor rulers, things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, 
And in case I forgot anything in those, all those descriptions, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Who is he? He is everlasting Father. Finally, we'll look at the gift of peace. Isaiah calls this child Prince of Peace. Now, we looked at the word peace a little bit last week. This word speaks more than just an absence of hostility. It doesn't mean person A and person B are getting along and that the hostility between country A and nation B has been uh, subsided. But the word peace that's being used here is first and foremost an inner peace, what the Jews called shalom. This word spoke, speaks of safety, tranquility, contentment, not contentment, contentment, <laughs> contentment, difference, <laughs> and perfect, perfect friendship. He's the Prince of Peace. Because of Christ, his followers have this to say, that our war with God is over. He, he's taking us as his enemy and adopted us. We read it in, Col in Ephesians earlier. He's adopted us as his son. He hasn't just overlooked our sin. He hasn't just forgotten that we were his enemy. No, he's adopted us as his son. How, how, did, how is that possible? The Prince of Peace. This is why we've got to look beyond Bethlehem to Calvary. This Prince of Peace has come to meet God's demand for holiness and pay for man's sinfulness. You can say it this way. Our peace deal with God has been brokered by the Son of the King, by the Prince, the Son of Heaven. Ephesians 2, 13 and 14, I love this, says this, but now in Christ Jesus, those of you who are far off that's us, all of us. Those of us who are far off have been brought near. How? By the blood of Christ. And I love what verse 14, how it begins. He himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. That's good news, friends. Even though Christmas is, you know, it's 364 more days till Christmas, we Get the benefit of this Christmas gift even today and every day that God allows us to live. And here's what it is. There is nothing between you and God if you're in Christ this morning. There's nothing between you and God. There's uninterrupted communion and fellowship there. And God will never allow anything to come between you. Does that make a difference? It makes a tremendous difference. But among other things, here's, here's what this does for us. Here's the gift that we have for, at Christmas. This is an end to performance-based religion. What do I mean by that? I mean simply this, because of the Prince of Peace. If I'm in Christ, if you're in Christ... Today, God is never going to love you more than he does today. But here's better news. God's never going to love you less than he does today. Do you mean it doesn't matter how I live? Do you mean I can just continue on in, in, in sinning? That's, that is great. No, it's not what I mean. Knowing that God standing with me and my standing with God has zero to do with what I do and is completely secured because of what Christ has done, rather than motivating us to licentiousness and sin, this should motivate us to holiness and obedience out of sheer reverence and love and appreciation for what the Prince of Peace has done and is doing in our lives. And that's important because so many people 
And I've even heard it just in, in passing here at Hope Community Church or kind of walking around. Oh, this, this bad thing happened to me this week. It mu I must have, what have I done to upset? No, 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 no. That's, you've missed the gospel in that. Rather, friends, than walking in angst and worry, let me encourage us all this year and every year and as long as God allows us to tarry here to receive that gift of peace that Christ, the Prince of Peace, has purchased for us. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. These are glorious names of this Christ child born in Bethlehem. What are we going to do with this gift? How are we going to appropriate these gifts, these continuous gifts in our lives? I, I, I believe there's at least three groups or types of people here listening this morning and whoever might listen to this later. The first group, maybe, maybe you're here or, or maybe you're listening to this and you've never received any of these gifts you, because you've not received Christ as your Savior. Uh, let me just speak to you for just a moment. If, if, if you've not come to Christ and humbled yourself and, and, and confessed and repented of your sin and trusted in Him, He's not your Savior this morning. And because of that, you're never going to attain true wisdom. You have no access to true wisdom. Why? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So you must humble yourself before him to tap into this inexhaustible source of wisdom here. You'll never be secure in this world or secure about the next one because you've not bowed your knee to Christ's sovereignty You'll never have a right understanding of Christ as a loving father figure. You will only see Christ as a judge. And you'll never know, never know true peace that only comes through God, from God, through Jesus Christ. My counsel to you this morning, the wisdom I could share with you this morning is to repeat to you the gospel command of Christ and the apostles. Repent. And believe in the gospel this morning. Receive eternal life and receive so much more in this Christ child. The second group of people, you're tr you've trusted Christ for your salvation, but maybe you're struggling in one or more, all of the areas that we've looked at this morning. You, you know Christ is your Savior. You're, you're sure of your salvation. You, you've confessed Him as Lord. You've turned from sin, but maybe you feel a bit overwhelmed and confused and confounded by the world around you. And let me just say, I get that. There is a lot of confusion and things to confound us in the world around us. And, but, but, but maybe because of what's going on around us, you can at times feel like a ship that's being tossed to and fro, like a ship without a rudder on the, on the, on the seas. Or maybe there are times or a continual uh, experience in your life that you lack the assurance of your salvation. I find that's one of the biggest struggles that, that believers like you and me can have is how do I know that I'm saved? You don't have that security that Christ offers you. Perhaps maybe you're looking at your own performance instead of what Christ accomplished for us in His life and death on the cross. Maybe at times you feel the Lord is disappointed or angry at you. Maybe even regretful that He saved you that you somehow let him down. Or maybe you feel anxious in your heart, no, no inner peace, and therefore you struggle to live at peace with others. What can I tell you this morning to do what we've tried to do over these past couple of weeks and what I hope we would do the other 51 weeks of the year? Look to Bethlehem's manger. Look, look to the life of Christ. Look to the cross. Look to the empty tomb. Look to the risen and ascended Savior this morning. And when you, when you sing a song about a way in a manger, you realize that what was laying there was not merely someone who, who can just promise you 
eternal life when this life is over. No, he, he wants to give you counsel. He wants to give you peace. He wants to give you wisdom. He wants to give you security and assurance this morning. Look to Christ. 2 Peter 1, 3 says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him, through the knowledge of Him who called us to His glory, His own glory and excellence. Third group of people that may be here this morning are those of you who have trusted Christ and by God's grace are walking in awareness of and great gratitude for the fullness of all of His promises. Praise God for you. My heart would be that we would all be walking in that awareness this morning. But, but there's, there's, there's even a word here for you. I, I could give you the word from 1 Thessalonians. Keep it up, and I do. But I'll give you another word as well. Guard your hearts this morning. Be vigilant. Never lose sight that there's a, a, there's a prowling enemy who would love nothing more than to rob you of your joy and your security and the peace that you are currently experiencing. So as we prepare to leave the celebration of Christmas behind yet again and put the ornaments back in the boxes and throw the wrapping paper in the bin along with those broken down gifts that you bought or received. May we be careful this year to not leave the greatest gift of Christmas behind until next December rolls around. May we continually remember the reason for the season. May we constantly have our eyes on Christ, who's not only the author or the originator or the pioneer of our faith, but he is also the perfecter, the finisher of our faith. For he truly is, brothers and sisters, the gift that keeps on giving. Let's pray.